Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike King, your host, and this is part one of our interview with former Harrier GR9, F-16 and F-35 pilot Hugh Nichols. In this episode, Hugh chats about what it was like to fly the Harrier GR9, including in operational theatres, and of course his US Air Force exchange tour on the F-16 CJ. Enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. So Hugh, how did you uh, first become interested in aviation? Um, I guess the first time was I was back about I was about fifteen, maybe sixteen, I guess, and um, I was kind of vaguely interested in it. But um, my great uncle actually bought me a flying lesson um, at a local flying school, <clears throat> which I did for one of my birthdays, and kind of got the bug from there, really. And and, th- and then just kept hounding him for more and more of those, and then you know the rest is history, I guess. So yeah, it, definitely the initial initial kind of interest was sparked from just flying along in a little Cessna 170, you know, over Warwickshire somewhere, and I kind of just really enjoyed it, you know. Awesome. So when did you first join the RAF? What was the year? Uh, I joined in 2000, April of 2000. April 2000. So you have to tell us about your first frontline aircraft because it's it's an iconic aircraft, and tell us about that. Yeah, so I guess you can't do more than five seconds talking to a Harrier pilot without intelligence. <laughs> right? um, yeah, so I was... Um, I, I went through training, uh, went to Valley, and then I, um, I got lucky or unlucky enough to, to get creamed off there. So I actually stayed at Valley as an instructor for uh, an extra three years. Some people would say that was um, just extra training. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, when I left there, uh, they were just closing down the Jaguar Force and just opening up the Typhoon Force. And uh, I, um, I got selected to go fly Harrier, which I was really excited with because I certainly, you know, always seen that aeroplane from afar and, you know, wanted to have a go at it. And, uh, and yeah, so they said that was my first frontline type was the, uh, was the Harrier. I, I flew uh, the, a little bit of GR7, a tiny bit of GR7, but mostly GR9. <clears throat> so what were your first thoughts of the Harrier? <laughs> first thoughts of the Harrier was it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess you come from a Hawk where it was, you know, it's a, steam-driven cockpit. I mean, I'd arguably, you'd, you'd say that Harry is a steam-driven cockpit now, but back then it really wasn't. And, um, you know, a steam-driven cockpit, no head-up display, um, you know, a map that's a piece of paper in your hand, uh, and really no weaponry to, to talk of. And then you, you walk out of that and you go straight into a Harrier where you've got all of those things. I remember being somewhat overwhelmed would be a, a, an understatement, certainly for the first you know, three years, <laughs> but yeah. certainly for the first few, certainly for the, the first few trips, I had no idea what was going on. I remember the guy that took me on my first flight, just, we were kind of late and um, there wasn't much time to go through what he was doing. He said, you're just going to hear beeps and, and whistles for the next 20 minutes while I get this thing up and running and then I'll talk to you again. And I literally sat there with my eyes wide open thinking there's right. no way on earth I'm going to do this, but, but you know, Training's training, and it gets you to a good place in the end, but definitely pretty overwhelmed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so can you talk us through some of your ground training on the Harrier? Ground training on the Harrier? Uh, you're racking my brains now. It's a long time ago. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I guess the first thing they do is they actually put you through. It's not really ground training, but but certainly pre-employment training. They actually send you to Shoreway to go fly helicopters for a bit, mm-hmm. which was, I, I still argue, is a pretty tenuous link, but it was a great – um, you know, a couple of weeks worth of just going off and flying helicopters around. It's the only aeroplane you'll ever fly in the military. You have to learn nothing about. I mean, we I remember sitting there the first morning. In fact, I did I did the hop course with Perty, who's uh, who's read one at the moment. Yeah. And I remember Perty and I sitting in the um, in the crew room at Shawbury the first morning. We'd gone off to the stores and you know, being diligent students, and we signed out all the books and all that kind of stuff. And we're sitting there reading these things, and one of the instructors comes in. He's like. What are you guys doing? Go get those things back. We'll just go flying. And so it was it was great fun, you know. So we did a bit of that. And then um <clears throat> we had to go and do the um, resistance to interrogation training, the Siri course, which I would, you know, never ever do again in the rest of my life. But was important. <laughs> um what else ground training wise? Um actually one of the things we had to do um was go on the uh, one of the Navy courses, the um 
course that basically teaches you how to kind of fight fires on ships and plug mm-hmm. holes in uh, in the in the decks and all that kind of stuff. Um, the acceptance being that pilots are more likely to go to the bar and, and drink a beer than than go and actually plug a hole in the side of a ship because <laughs> we'd probably be a liability rather than a help. Um, but but yeah, we had to do that. And then obviously ground school. Um, I can't remember how long ground school was, but probably a couple of weeks worth of ground school, I guess. Uh, and then into the simulators, and then finally you get near the aeroplane. You know? So it's a long process. So. Yeah, so can you remember your first flight in the Harrier? Uh, yeah, I, not not every instance, but certainly I remember what I kind of just alluded to there, which was, you know, the <clears throat> the myriad of beeps and squeaks and, and things I had no idea about while, um, while the guy was starting the thing up. And then... You know, I can't remember exactly what we did during the flight, but I certainly remember coming back and the first, you know, first hovering experience was definitely pretty wacky. And, and you know, the T-Bird was relatively underpowered anyway because you got an extra person in there and, you know, the various issues with center of gravity, you know, various other things like that that meant you didn't actually, you didn't ever hover for very long. Um, and so it was definitely pretty, pretty aggressive, you know, very quick hover and then, you know, slam it on the, on the deck. And like I say, I kind of came out of that thing going, oh, my God. There's no way on earth I'm going to be able to do this. Yeah. <laughs> so, definitely eye-opening, definitely. Of course, but uh, you actually flew the Harry in combat, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, in an in a operational theatre, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about, like, how the Harry operated in that theatre at the time? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we were... We were doing kind of two roles, which arguably merged into one, which was close air support and um, uh, ISR. So you know the kind of the, the surveillance and reconnaissance. Um, so, but you know you never really knew what you were going to go and do. So we were out there, you know, obviously in support of the ground forces that were out there at the time. Most of our work done in the Helmand province because we were out in Kampar, which is relatively close to Helmand. So probably 80, 70, 80 percent of our work was done in Helmand, which was generally the place where most of the fighting was occurring. Um, and we would we would go off and do everything from you know very few but the odd predetermined strike where you know maybe someone knew that someone was going to be there at a certain time or you know they they found a you know uh, you know a, a warehouse full of drugs or you know whatever it was mm-hmm. that was very very few and far between most of our work was um, just in support of ground forces so if the ground forces had a big movement on that day they would call for air. We would go over there and we'd um, we'd support them for that. Um, some of our stuff was kind of quite daily, quite mundane. So you know, you go out to certain places and you go search up and down roads, just looking for you know uh, anomalies in the side of the road, different heat patterns, those kind of things that would suggest that maybe someone had been digging in an IED or you know something like that. Uh, and then a lot of it was just um, mad panic scrambles from one place to the other. So maybe you're off doing one of those, and then suddenly there was a what they call a tick, you know, troops in contact, uh, and then they would just find you know the the closest um, aircraft to support that that troops in contact. And you'd all it's kind of like the moth to a flame a lot of the times. You know, like everyone wants a piece of the action. So it was a bit, a bit of a race to get to where things were going off, and then you know you get involved with that. And you know a lot of the times it became nothing, but a lot of the times it became quite exciting as well. So. A little bit of everything, really. So what kind of uh, weapons would you be carrying on this time? So we just brought um, Paveway 4 into service with the um, with the Harrier at that point. So we were pretty much exclusively uh, Paveway 4s, and then we also carried a rocket pod as well, CRV-7, okay. which is a, a, a rocket pod. I, think there were, I want to say there was 19 on each wing, something like that. Wow. Um, so you could shoot them as... As singles or as as a whole whole nineteen or as you know however many you wanted you can you could kind of decide between those so and they actually it's basically I mean to all intents and purposes it was a hand grenade on the front of a, a rocket that went mm-hmm. really damn fast it was Mark three Mark four something like that it was it was r- ridiculously fast um, so you could kind of use them as much more of a direct weapon almost you know almost akin to a cannon or a gun um, and um, so you could use those for you know the, the smaller more, you know, direct strikes, if you like, and then you have the Paveway 4 if you needed to take down something bigger. Pretty impressive. So how long did you spend on the Harrier Hume? Uh, I was there for just just short of four years, I guess, in total. Impressive, yeah. And then you had a bit of a, a an exciting exchange to it. Uh, can you tell <laughs> us about this? Yeah, so... Um, I guess I kind of 
decided I wanted to go and live somewhere else in the world, do something a bit different. Um, so um, at that point, uh, the Royal Air Force had a whole load of exchange tours all over the world, um, and I just started applying for them. Um, and, uh, and I got lucky enough to get the F-16 CJ exchange, which was at a place called Shore Air Force Base, which is in uh, Sumter, South Carolina. Um, so I did three years over there. I actually did six months at Luke over in Phoenix, and then I did two and a half years over in, uh, in South Carolina here. Um, uh, flying the F-16 CJ, which was amazing. Wow. So can you tell us what it was like, what was it like uh, transitioning to an RAF to a US Air Force <laughs> Air Force Base? Uh, was, yeah. it, was there a big difference? Yeah, there was. <laughs> <laughs> um, in lots of ways. First difference is I always remember driving in the gate the first morning, and it was a Luke Air Force Base, um, Phoenix, Arizona. It was the end of August. I remember driving in the base the first morning, and it was 115 degrees Fahrenheit as I drove through the gate. So, so that's the first big difference. Is <laughs> it was insanely hot, uh, but they do a pretty good job of coping with that. Um, is it? You know, the, the the USAF and the Air Force, the Royal Air Force, Royal Navy, etc., work together an enormous amount. But there's still huge kind of um, what's the word? I guess. Um, uh, just differences in the way that they operate, I guess, is the way to say it. I mean, the, U- the USAF is just such an enormous organization. At the, at the time, extremely well-funded. Uh, I mean, money was no object. Uh, we were flying the top of the top, top you know, state-of-the-art airplanes uh, on probably one of the more high-profile frontline aircraft or, and, and squadrons, bases, et cetera. And it was kind of eye-opening as to how much resource they could get. Mm-hmm. Um, they will say that America and England are, you know, two countries um, separated by a common language, right? I mean, and that is that is definitely very, very um, prevalent. Yeah. So certainly had to learn the lingo pretty quick. But um, as you can probably tell from my accent, after ten years out here, I, I kind of, I kind of got that. And then, of course, moving from the Harrier, which was very, very ground attack focused and extremely good at that, to going to an airplane that's extremely good at everything. Was was definitely eye opening. That's probably the I, w- I would argue is probably the steepest learning curve of my career was the um, getting into an F sixteen and then within months of being at, um, on the front line unit um, in South Carolina, being expected to be one of the more senior guys in the squadron and instructor, all that kind of stuff, and I mean, really having not done very much of a lot of problem, you know, sixty or seventy percent of their mission, I'd really never seen before. So it was a huge learning curve there, which was certainly. You know, probably for a year, I I didn't really have a, a life outside of work because I had to <laughs> had to get my head around it. But you know, no, it's cosmic. It just if it's not bred into you from the from the outset, you know, it's just it's it's just very different. You know, so certainly lots of differences, but a great experience. And what was it like having afterburner for the first time? <laughs> afterburner is <laughs> always cool. There's just no way around it. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. Initially, certainly you've got to remember that it's there, which is which was certainly caught me out a couple of times. You know, why am I losing so badly here? And then you realise, ah, yeah, you know, I've got a bit of extra <laughs> thrust in it, kind of thing. But um, afterburn is also a great way of burning gas very quickly. So that's the other option. That, you know, the instructors on the F-16 will call it student cruise, where a student will just leave the afterburner in and fly around all day, and then suddenly they run out of gas pretty quick. So definitely another management thing, but you know, great fun to have certainly. Yeah. So, what squadron were you with uh, when you went to the USA? I was. Uh, I, I did my training on the 62nd, which is called the Spikes, out at, out at Luke. And then my actual uh, frontline squadron was the 79th. It was the Tigers here at, um, in some in Santa, South Carolina. So, our viewers always love this question. Did you ever uh, conduct DACT with you know the similar types of F-15s, F-18s at the at the time? Oh yeah, absolutely. We did. Um, we were, I was kind of lucky in the, the timing of when I went to, to shore because we were they were starting to pull out of a lot of the you know the places over in the, the Middle East and they were starting to kind of try and redress the the training problems that they'd had you know of you know people just getting lumped into doing close air support forever you know all that kind of stuff so I did numerous red flags red flag Alaska various other kind of um, you know high end exercises like that and. You know, managed to you know, and, and as part of all of those, you end up on you know um, those kind of those kind of fights where you end up up against someone that is not in the same aeroplane as you. You know, so yeah, definitely got um, got up, up close and personal with you know F-15s. 
And we fought Raptors a few times, um, obviously lots of other F-16s. And then, uh, yeah, we had the Japanese, the jazz stuff guys out on one of the exercises. So they had F- F-15s again, but, um, you know, certainly lots of those, lots of those guys, yeah. And how did the F-16 fare against the F-15, for instance? Um, I mean, that's a, that's another story in itself, right? I mean, you can talk about that for hours. But, I mean, personally, um, the, I mean, the Block the block 50 F-16 that I flew was that we had the big Pratt & Whitney engine, the big wide mouth. And if you took, you know, if you put it fairly clean or, you know, just a centerline tank, I mean, you'd struggle to beat that in any airplane that doesn't have some crazy thrust vectoring or, you know, those kind of things. So, I mean, an F-15 I would see as relatively easy kill. Uh, never, nothing's ever easy. An F-15 is an amazing airplane, don't get me wrong. But certainly if you went up against one of those things in a relatively clean Block 50, I think you'd probably fare pretty well. Um, we fought the F-18s quite a lot as well because um, actually, you know, when we were, when I was based up in Sumter, South Carolina, down here in Beaufort, there was an F-8, lots of F-18 units, you know. So we'd meet them a few times and they're an interesting character to fight because they'll they'll point their nose at you very, very quickly to the extent that it's actually pretty terrifying. Wow. But you've got to remember that they run out of energy very quickly when they do that. So, you know, it's just it's just kind of learning how those, how those different airplanes are going to operate, you know, against you. Um, but certainly, you know, a, a well-trained F-16 pilot and one of those big, powerful F-16s, I mean, he, you'd struggle to find someone that's going to do much better than that person, I think. And I wouldn't class myself as that, certainly, but there was some <laughs> pilots in the, uh, in the room at that point, definitely. So how long did you spend on the F-16? How many hours did you get? And where did you go after this? Uh, I did about, I did just just shy of three years, almost, in fact, almost three years to the day. I, I think I got about five or six hundred hours in the end. So, some, you know, I did pretty well. At that. Yes, yeah. I mean, when you think about that nowadays or in, or in recent history, that's incredible. I mean, in the time, it was pretty much what you'd expect, right? But, um, but you know, when you look at the hours people are getting nowadays, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but yeah, I think I got 500 hours-ish.